Hello, and welcome to Adapt of Chicago Productions. For 17 years, the television show devoted to disability issues. I'm Joel Margolis, your host, and with me today we have two very special guests, Mr. Mike Tellerino of oh. the Canines for Veterans Training Center and also a very faithful canine, Greta. <laughs> yes. Mike, I'd like to ask you, what exactly is the Canines for Veterans Training Center? Well, Canine for Veterans Training Center was uh, created to train service dogs for veterans that have PTSD. Now, what exactly does a service dog do for someone who has PTSD? Joel, it's an amazing gift what these dogs can provide for our veterans. They are trained to block for the veterans. In other words, if a veteran's in a crowded situation and he really doesn't like his space invaded, the dogs are trained to gently nudge that person away from our veterans so they don't feel like they're being, uh, their space is being invaded. Um, they're trained to retrieve things off the floor for them. They're trained to brace for them if they have a, a mobility issue. But most importantly, what I think is probably one of the best assets that these dogs can provide for a veteran is that our veterans come home with PTSD, they have night terrors, which is no more than a, a bad dream. Like nightmares. Of exactly. Uh, our dogs are trained to sense this when the veterans have this and they're trained to wake them up from that night terror so they don't have to spend time there. They bring them back to like now time, reality. So while the person with PTSD is still asleep and experiencing mm -hmm. night terror, as you call the nightmare, mm -hmm. the dog can sense that? Correct. And then wakes up the sleeping vet, okay, mm -hmm. so that they're not continued to be plagued by the exactly. nightmare. Exactly. Most veterans, Joel, are afraid to go to sleep at night. They could be in a house full with people, and as long as everybody's up with them, they're okay. As soon as everybody in the house goes to sleep and they're left alone, their tendency to want to go to sleep is, is almost gone. Because the fear of the fear nightmare. Fear of, of going to that bad place. And when they have a service dog with them, they know if they do go to that night terror, that this dog's gonna wake them up. Their service dog is gonna wake them up from that. And on a more general level, the service dog can provide a sense of companionship oh my God, for yes. vets with PTSD? They're their best friends. They go with them, trains, planes, buses, uh, shopping, uh, no matter where they go. Uh, it's a federal law that these dogs are trained and are, are certified to be a service dog. They can go anywhere with our veterans. Now, you spoke about the mission of providing these dogs to vets mm -hmm. who have PTSD. Do you sometimes have vets in your training center who have some other type of disability that also requires a service dog? Yes, it's called TBI, traumatic brain injury. That was traumatic brain injury? Brain injury, they call it TBI. And it's where it's an infliction of their mobility issues or they have a, So this um, is a neurological problem? Correct, and our dogs are trained to brace for them. Um, most of our guys that have TBI walk with a cane or uh, very unsteady with their walking. So their dogs are provided with a special harness that if they do need some assistance getting out of a chair, there's a special uh, handle that's made on the vest for them so they could use it to get up out of that chair and the dogs are trained to steady them and, and brace for them. Now for those vets that suffer from this type mm -hmm. of brain damage, do some of them also have problems retrieving physical objects? Oh in yes, their yes, and our dogs are trained to pick things off the floor for them. Pick things off the floor, retrieve things retrieve, that are at a yes, distance? Get their keys off the table. Um, pick things off the floor. They won't go get a beer for you, though. They <laughs> won't. The dogs are strictly in a temperance mode. Correct. I understand. Now, how do these vets come to you? How do they find your center, and how do you find the vets? Well, most of our vets come to us via the internet. Um, we put out there. We have a website out there, which is K, the letter K, the number nine, the letter S for Veterans N F P which is not for profit, dot org. Canines for Veterans, NFP dot org. Correct. And on our website, it explains what we do, how we do it. Uh, and there's also an application that they have to fill out. 
Once they fill that application and send it to us, we have three veterans that are on our board of review that are veterans with PTSD that will review their application, go over everything with them, they'll interview them over the phone, they'll find out if, you know, what they're expecting from a service dog. Some people have too many expectations from a service dog. Um, and at that point, then we'll go do an in-home interview with them. And then we'll bring them out to the center to meet some of our service dogs to see which one they sort of bond with. And in addition to finding enrollees for your center via the internet, mm -hmm. do you do any outreach through veterans organizations? Yes, we work with the VA constantly. And you sometimes send someone out to speak at either an American Legion yes. post or a VFW, VFW post? Yes, do, we do that constantly. We want our veterans to know that there is help out there, okay? Uh, I, don't, I don't think we can get the word out there enough that there is hope, there is a place you could turn that if you're going through PTSD, you don't have to go through it alone. Now, after a vet applies to your center, mm -hmm. and if they are accepted for training, what actually does the training consist of? Well, first of all, the, uh, we pull all our dogs, all our uh, dogs from um, kill shelters, which in that case, we send our trainer out to the shelter and we test these dogs for their temperament. They have to have a certain temperament to fit into our program. If they should fit into our program, we'll then pull the dog from that shelter We'll place them at our training center, and they'll train for about four months. They'll do basic, advanced training, and agility training for four months. Once they do that training, we'll then introduce them to a veteran that they're going to be assigned to, and that veteran will come in three days a week minimum to work one-on-one -on -one with that service dog. And are the dogs drawn from a variety of different breeds or a fairly narrow uh, range of breeds? You know what? Again, it's not a breed specific thing that we look for. We look for temperament. Look at Greta. She's, I mean, Greta is about as relaxed as you can get. And Greta, in terms of breed, is a German, German shepherd? German shepherd, and her color purebred. is called a purebred. She's a, her color is a sable. But uh, typically, this is, you know, what a service dog does. You know, it's just there, it's with you. Now, operating a center like this, okay, mm -hmm is not something that comes without cost, oh, okay? Not at all. Uh, where do you get the funding to operate the center? Well, let me start at the beginning, okay? Um, I have a, one of our guys that are on our director, Sam. Um, he worked for this company that had a huge building on Roosevelt and Central. Sam went in there and asked him if they had any space that they'd like to help donate to K-9 for veterans so we could open this training center. Well, this building is at Roosevelt and Central, Central on the west side of Chicago. Right, 5430 West Roosevelt. Okay. So they told Sam, yeah, we got this location, but we're really the space. We're really not sure you could use it. So we went and looked at it, and it had some nice office space, but the, there was nothing in the building. It was just cinder block walls, no running water, no toilets, nothing. It A was huge just empty box? Yeah, huge empty box. So and thought, about how many square feet is the building? Uh, just under 7,000 square feet. Sizable. Yeah, okay. so we thought, okay, now what do we do? That we have it, you know, they gave it to us, and donated the space to us at no cost. So um, our, one of our, our vice president, Reggie Latuka, went to Home Depot and said they were looking, maybe they could donate some paint so we could just paint the offices. They asked us why we were gonna do what we were doing. Reggie told them that we are opening a training center. They said, well, let's come out, maybe we'll take a look at it. So Home Depot came out and they said, you know what, we could take this on as a project for our veterans. So they did an extreme makeover for us from floor to ceiling, front to back, put kennels in, put a state-of-the-art kitchen in, put a bathroom in. All done at all the expense, done of, at Home the expense Depot. of Home Depot. So instead of having to apply to 20 different foundations. Just one. 
It was just one, just and one. they agreed to fund it, and it they was a gift honored that their couldn't, promise. Couldn't be even believed at the time when we received it. Mm -hmm. And the best part is, is that they worked, and they they knew exactly what they wanted to do for our service dogs. They they matched the color. They did research on the colors that they were going to use for the facility. Because colors make a difference sure. in terms of the mm -hmm. dogs. Yeah. Yeah, but they, it's, you know, it's an amazing job they did. And now we have a place where we can train our service dogs. Our center is open 24 hours a day to our veterans that could come in any time, day or night, come in, have a cup of coffee, they could sit, talk to their dog, they could take their dog for a walk. Now, you also have special events that are fundraising. Oh, we just had a, uh, um, a month ago, we had an event where we presented 11 service dogs to 11 veterans. We had 536 people attend our event. And you say presented the dogs to the veterans. Mm -hmm. That makes it sound as if the dogs were a gift. Yes. The vets do not pay for these it's dogs? It's 100% free to the veteran. Not only is it free to the veteran, we provide free food for the life of that dog so the veterans don't have to worry about food. And we also apply m uh, the medical needs for that dog for the life of that dog as well. Now, does the Veterans Administration offer you any help in this regard? Not at all. No, they Not have made no contribution. No, in fact, a few years ago, the, uh, <coughs> the VA had a program where they were actually providing service dogs to <coughs> veterans. Uh, after about, I think it was about a year or two, what they decided that it had no clinical value, which is crazy because anyone who's seen what a service dog can do for a veteran that has PTSD will be the first one to tell you that it makes a difference between night and day in our veterans. But the VA stopped it because they said there was no clinical value to it. Go so figure. when the VA stopped it, they were not willing to provide any financial no, help? none whatsoever. Okay. Now, does that mean, therefore, that in addition to the one paid trainer, mm -hmm. you have volunteers doing a variety of different yes, tasks? Yes, yes. Cleaning kennels, walking the dogs, cleaning, cleaning the training center, um, taking, answering calls. Um, like I said, our center is open 24 hours a day to our veterans. Now, your center is located at Roosevelt near Central mm -hmm. Avenue. I believe it's the South Austin neighborhood. It's the old Sunbeam building. Okay. And that's on the west side of Chicago. But do your veterans come to you primarily from the west side and the western suburbs? Not at all. We've got guys, uh, we've got veterans coming in from Colorado, uh, the east coast, California, you know, wherever. Um, we don't say you have to be from Chicago to get a service dog. And those who come in from out of town, where do they stay during the training? Well, they, uh, they come in. If they're out of town, what they do is they'll come in, they'll stay for a week at a hotel, uh, and then they'll train with their dog. They'll come back in a month later, stay for a week, uh, and train with their dog. What we're doing now, Joe, is the city of, the, I'm sorry, the village of Lyons um, just donated a building to us in Lyons. 5,000 square feet, and what it is, it's going to be a building it's just for an outreach center. It's to help veterans find a job. It's to help them teach computer skills. It's to uh, prepare them for interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to get, the, we'll be able to give them rides, get them rides from and to the VA for their medical appointments. It's however we could assist the veterans in any way we can. Um, at, the, at that facility, there's going to be three rooms that our veterans that come in from out of state will be able to stay at that facility and you know stay there and then do their training at, at like the a training small center. scale bed and breakfast exactly exactly this way again there's no cost to the veteran now those veterans that live someplace in the six county metropolitan chicago area mm -hmm. do most of them come to you by automobile yes yes are the majority of them able to drive there themselves yes and we have some that take uber okay so they come to you in a variety of mm -hmm. different different right. modes okay now all of this involves an enormous amount of work on your part okay have you been primarily a volunteer I've been a volunteer since day one completely a volunteer. completely a volunteer everyone and our, our, our from our vice president Reggie Latuka to our board of directors to our directors that oversee the whole operation everyone's a volunteer now, this represents an enormous amount of work on your part. Mm -hmm. um, where in the world did you develop such an intense commitment to this particular not-for-profit cause? What is your own background that led you into this? Well, 
Joel, originally I started out as the founder and CEO of an uh, organization called PAWS Illinois. PAWS? PAWS, P-A-W-S, Illinois. Um, it's a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. We would foster and rescue. It was a home-based foster operation, and we would d rescue dogs from shelters and find homes for them. Well, I decided that I wanted to really do something to try to help our veterans that were coming back from serving our country. Um, so we were getting food from um, Natural Balance Pet Food. So we were said, well, let's, let's just give these veterans free food for their service dogs or dogs or even cats just because they served our country, just something to give back to them. So we started that program, it was called Pets for Vets. Well, after doing that and meeting some of these veterans that had service dogs, and listening to their story, telling me the difference that it had made in their life, it actually, they, most of them would tell you, if it wasn't for my service dog, I'd either be dead or in jail. That's oh the difference God. they made. So after getting to meet these guys and seeing what these dogs truly meant to them, I just felt there's something I wanted to do. So what, I got together with our board of directors and we decided that we were going to start a separate 501c3 specifically for veterans with PTSD to provide, to provide them service dogs. And the founding of PAWS, mm -hmm. okay, did that come out of some special experiences you had as a veteran? You know, I've, I've, I've always um, been an, an animal advocate. I've always rescued animals, horses, dogs, whatever I could. Um, and again, it's just a feeling of giving something back. And if you remember, back at the time, you know, four or five years ago when people were just going through some hard times, the housing market crashed, people didn't know what to do with their service, with their dogs, so we were just bringing them and dropping them off at uh, shelters. So I figured, you know what, if we could stop that, if people had a way to feed their dogs and not have to worry about some basic medical care, they can keep these dogs at home rather than putting them in a shelter because they couldn't afford the food, they couldn't afford the medical, and that's what was happening. They would just take them to the shelter and say, look, I can't afford to feed my family, let alone my dog, and I can't take care of the medical, so I don't want to be unfair to dogs. So they were in the impression, if they brought it to the shelter, that the shelter was going to find this perfect home for that dog, when in reality, chances are that dog was going to be euthanized within 90 days from when it hit the shelter. Now. As someone who has a special concern for animals, mm -hmm. it's no surprise that you became involved in this type of effort. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, you you're, are a vet yourself. Yes. What branch of the service did you I was serve? in the Army Reserves. In the Army Reserves. Yeah. And did you have some particular experiences in the Army Reserves that in some way highlighted the needs of vets to you? You know what? I've seen guys that were coming home from, from serving our country and uh, you know it was it was just ridiculous what they weren't receiving from the from the VA you know and it's always been a need that you know we've got these guys willing to go over there and 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 put their life on the line and and not ask for anything in return but yet when they do come home there's nothing for them they get they get absolutely nothing I, I, there's there's nothing for these guys they're so overlooked it's just a shame. So you felt there were real needs on the parts of Without vets. a doubt. Okay. And you yourself saw a number of cases where there was a dramatic level of need? Uh, Joel, I, I, I've talked <clears throat> to some veterans before they get their service dog that no one should have to have went through what they went through. And then not only to go through that, and, but not to get the help when you come home. You know, most, most, most of these guys, when they come home with PTSD, their families aren't prepared for, for the person that's coming home. Not prepared in what way, Mike? They don't know what to expect. You know, PTSD is so misunderstood, Joel, because you can't see. It's not a disease you could see. I, I shouldn't use the word disease. It's not an infliction that you could see, okay? So if you can't see it, people don't understand it. They, they you know, well, what's wrong with him? He's okay. He's walking. He's talking. They don't understand the horrors that this guy is facing internally. And that's the part that I think really upsets me the most is that people don't fully understand what PTSD is. And it was your perception of that that played no small role in your involvement in these A hundred percent. I just felt that I really, after meeting these veterans with PTSD and talking to ones that 
had the PTSD and didn't have a service dog, I just felt that I wanted everyone who had PTSD to know what it was like to have a Greta in their life. Now, clearly, in seeing vets with PTSD, you saw some unmet needs in their lives, mm -hmm. and that led you to work intensively with veterans. Mm -hmm. But as a result of that, have you found other needs amongst veterans that you feel are sometimes not recognized by the general public? You know, our veterans are so misunderstood when they come home from the service with PTSD. The VA, in my opinion, this is my opinion, just feels that it's easier to keep them sedated than it is to get them the help that they need. Keep them sedated? Sedated. They, I've got guys that are on 17 different pills a day. After they've had a service dog, they're down to three or four. That's the marked difference that these dogs could make. But again, I think that the VA should prepare our, the families of these veterans that are coming home what to expect from their returning spouse. Now, that they're not the same person that left. What exactly should be done when you say prepare? Do these families need to be sensitized in yes, some way? Yes, they need to have some counseling to exp learn that their behavior is going to be erratic, they're going to have mood swings, they're not the same person that they were that l when they left. And in addition to the problems associated with PTSD, okay, have you seen other needs on the parts of vets that you feel are unmet? You know, uh, job skills. Okay, when a veteran fills out an application, he's been in the service for six years. How does he relate to filling out that application that's going to equate to the last six years of experience he had in the military? Great leadership skills? How do you translate that into an application that, you know, you, a prospective employer is going to look at and say, well, you're a great candidate. So we need to prepare these guys that are coming home how to go about getting back into a normal life. And do you think that better preparation could do something to lower the unemployment rate among veterans? Oh, veterans? God, yes. You know, uh, we have a program. Um, it's to teach veterans how to use basic computer skills. It's to teach them. We're going to prep them for their initial interviews. We have a company called uh, Bridge to Success that works with us that will take these veterans out and prepare them for the interview and provide them with a, a complete wardrobe, shoes, shoes, socks, shirts, everything, to go on that interview, to get them ready so they, they look good, they feel good about So themselves. you're saying that something as basic as interviewing for a job, mm -hmm. there are many vets who lack those interviewing yes. skills? Yes, yes. Okay. Do you think there are also are unmet needs in terms of vets' information about the labor markets? You know what, I think the whole thing is that, Joe, you know, is that the VA is not putting enough information out there on the services that are offered to our veterans. I don't think, I think they need to, you know, it's even like a service dog, okay? The VA doesn't put it out there. There's not enough attention given to PTSD and the effects that it has. We're, we're actually building a memorial wall in Shanahan State Park. Where is that, Mike? It's right outside of Joliet. Um, what it is, is we worked with the governor, who was really incredible about working with us. Um, to, it's it's going to be five pillars, one for each branch of service, and a cellar, center piece. Um, and it's all going to be for the veterans who lost the battle to PTSD. So finally, someone... Lost the battle? Lost what, the battle. These, it's what be, does that mean in concrete They committed terms. suicide. Veterans who committed suicide. Right. This is going to be a memorial for them. Problems. Correct. It's going to be a memorial for them. Now, I think this touches on a subject that we don't hear much about mm -hmm. in the general press. You're saying there's a certain percentage of the PTSD victims who are so untreated or so underserved that they drift into a suicidal Sui depression. Right. What it is, they the they're, they're, what they claim that 22 veterans a day commit suicide. Let's make sure we understand that correctly. In the nation as a whole, 22 veterans a day commit, commit suicide. suicide? And that's the VA statistics, not ours. Okay? But let me tell you, let me just add a little side note to that. That is not including the veterans that come home that do not want to register for their benefits because they don't want the stigma that's attached to PTSD. So in addition to treating the PTSD itself, mm -hmm. we have a very real problem 
in helping to sensitize the vets and educate the public Correct. to destigmatize the PTSD? Yes. Well, it sounds to me as if there's quite a work yet to be done in this field. Yes, there is. Okay. I think, however, our viewers today have learned that you and those working with you at Canines for Veterans are already doing quite a bit. For those who would like more information, they can go to your website. Yes. And that is the letter K. The number nine. The number nine. F O R. Letter S. Vet veterans. K. The letter K and the number nine. The letter S. F O R. Veterans. N F P. Dot org. Dot org. Okay. Or they can call us. And what is your telephone number? Seven seven three eight five four one thousand. Seven seven three. 854-1000, and there will always be someone there yep. to give information about yep. your center and what it does. And if they know a veteran that needs help, have them contact us. Have them come in, meet these other veterans that have PTSD. Well, I think our viewers have learned a great deal today about Good. your remarkable efforts. Thank I want to thank you for coming It was my in. pleasure, Joe. My pleasure. And it's been more than a pleasure to have you. Thank you. And I want to thank Greta. Greta. Okay, for coming in today. <laughs> Greta, thank you for your participation in this experience. Well, I can say that as canine, we have touched or we have helped up to as 20 veterans. We have 10 dogs currently being trained. Um, I can only say that uh, from point the beginning when we have our veterans with us who do not speak or who are, do not want to go out. Once we give them the dog and they start working with them, it's, they're a whole totally different person. So that is the joy we get in helping them. I know one of the most wonderful things I've heard is that a vet who is sleeping and has a bad dream, you know, he's being, who knows what's going on, you know, yes. and the dog will wake him up. How do you get a dog to do that? Well, it's, it's all about creating that bond. It's all about that dog understanding when they are sensing that the, you know, their veteran is trembling in bed or talking in their sleep or screaming in their sleep or crying in their sleep. The dogs become very sensitive to that and that will make them wake them up, lick their face and comfort them. Corporal Patrick Phillips, United States Marine Corps. I was attached to Regimental Combat Team 5. This is my service dog, Marsoc. She's currently in training to be my PTSD service dog. Hi, this is Mike Tellerigo with Canine Veterans. How can I help you? Yes, yes, yes. Um, what you would do initially, you would fill out an application online at K9 for veterans, nfp.org.